Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 7 with Sarah Campbell. I'm the host of the Free Dive Cafe. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and fears and personal philosophies of those who choose to adventure on one breath. The Free Dive Cafe can be found at freedivecafe.com. Go to freedivecafe.com to find everything you need to know about listening to the show and connecting to the Facebook page. As always, if you have any comments or suggestions, go to the website and leave a message through the contact page. The podcast is free to listen to and always will be, but it takes me many, many hours to edit an episode and do the post-production, not to mention the time it takes to connect with and interview the guests. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here and would like to show your support, you can do that by becoming a patron of the show. By clicking the support the podcast button on the website, you can donate a little bit of cash to keep the show running. If you met me in a cafe and wanted to buy me a copy to say thanks, why not send me the money through the website? To the small band of patrons who are leading the way and already supporting the show, big love to you guys. Thank you so much. On today's episode, we have Sarah Campbell. Sarah is a bit of a legend in the freediving community. She is a Kundalini yoga teacher and four times world record holding freediver. She's the founder of Discover Your Depths, a unique teaching and personal growth philosophy based on yoga, meditation, freediving, and mind body awareness. Sarah has been practicing Kundalini yoga since 2003 and attributes her phenomenal success in breath hold diving from beginner to three times world record holder in just nine months, diving to 90 meters below the surface of the ocean on just one breath, to her practice. She is one of only a handful of women to have dived below 100 meters. She lives in her chosen hometown of Dahab on the Red Sea in Egypt, where she teaches classes, workshops, and retreats. She also teaches retreats and presents internationally. Sahara was so much fun to talk to, and her personal story and outlook on life are truly inspirational. Sarah's episode and show notes can be found at freedivecafe.com. If you have any thoughts or comments about what we discussed in this episode, feel free to leave comments there. Okay guys, let's dive. with um, if you could just talk a little bit about where you come from and what your early life was like you know you uh, you said you got I I read here that you got to the point where you were a chronically ill London PR girl right so yeah if you could just give a little bit of a background how you got to that point and from there we can go on how you came to free diving yeah Um, so I mean, my my story about my journey into freediving, I don't know if it's typical or, or very unusual, but I was living in London and I was, you know, having gone to university, I was then working and trying to forge a career for myself. Um, never really felt very happy, never felt truly alive living in London. Um, and also found myself get getting more and more unwell. Um, and it was in... I think uh, late 1999 that I was diagnosed with uh, a disease called ulcerative colitis, which is a stress-related um, digestive uh, condition um, whereby the large intestine gets full of ulcers and you get all kinds of problems. So it's not really a nice, <laughs> nice no, illness. It doesn't sound like the most pleasant it. condition. Yeah. <laughs> You can imagine what happens. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I sort of found that my my life was becoming more and more restricted. I wasn't really sure um, 
how to uh, how to progress. Uh, but something inside of me told me that uh, allopathic medicine and Western doctors were not the way, even though I had no real background in spiritual practice or beliefs or um, I was I was really I was, you know, a typical London girl um, out partying working out. I, w I think I did the London Marathon in 2000. Um, I was an aerobics instructor on top of my PR job. So I was really, I was pushing my body to its limits. And I was also a vegetarian, but I would say a fairly unconscious vegetarian. Right, yeah. So I was living on Starbucks coffee and muffins for breakfast yeah. and lunch. And then, you know, sometimes even just cocktails for dinner and kidding myself that blood <laughs> Bloody Marys counted as dinner because they were tomatoes. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It used to be Guinness for me, you know, like it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was so rich that I was sure that it must be doing me some good. Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, at some point my body just really said, um, "Hello, girl, wake up," and, uh, and and so I hit my crisis point, which is a blessing. It really is a blessing. And so at that moment, somehow I connected with some kind of wisdom inside of myself saying, okay, it's, it's, the solution is not to go on steroids. Um, the solution is to find the reason inside of yourself as to what's happened here, what the disconnect is. So I started a journey of um, weekly acupuncture. And my acupuncturist was trying to push me towards um, finding a yoga practice, which I enjoyed. Funnily enough, I hated yoga. I thought it was the most boring, pointless thing <laughs> I'd ever come across in my life. And every week I would go back and see my acupuncture and say, and so, and I was like, no, I, yeah, you know, it's a workout. I can do that better on my own. If I go to the gym, it's a stretch. I can also do that better on my own. Really, what's the point? I don't see what yoga gives me additionally. And uh, so after about six months, of uh, getting more and more frus frustrated, me and my acupuncturist, I said, okay, look, here's the deal. I'm going to go on a yoga holiday. And um, if I don't like it after a whole week, can we just kind of leave the topic? Because I just really think it's not going to be for me. And it was on that week that um, I had uh, a moment of, ex of, of pure life transforming experience. So the teacher said, okay, we're going to do some chanting today. And I sort of was sitting there and I was like, oh my God, dear God, no, chanting. That's just so hippie and new agey. And I sort of, I almost put my hand up and said, sorry, but I'm British. I don't do that kind of thing. And um, and then, you know, the, the little voice in my head saying, come on, you're here to have new experiences. So just be open and try. So she put the words on the board and, you know, we started chanting. And I had this complete spontaneous release of energy inside of my body and it was really like there was an upwards and an outwards flow of energy moving through me and we did the mantra a few times and by the end I was I lit I was sitting there and I I couldn't have told you who I was um and I realized this was what had been missing from all of those yoga classes even though I didn't know that that's what I had been looking for because I hadn't experienced it yet some part of me knew that there was something greater than I'd been experiencing in the Hatha and the Ashtanga classes. And it was this deep spiritual connection. And the mantra that we had chanted is the core mantra for Kundalini yoga. Um, and it's the mantra which forms now a core part of my uh, yoga for free diving teachings, because it's the one that really connects us with um, recognizing we're part of this amazing fabric of, of the universe you know we're part of nature we belong um, and there's a an inbuilt wisdom within us which can guide us and has far much more power and potential than we can uh, generate through our intellect so that was really the that was the moment where everything shifted hugely and then I just started practicing Kundalini yoga um, it was a very uh, painful long healing process I was crying every single class but it was um the tears in hindsight i realized were a process of realizing how disconnected i'd been with myself to allow myself to get so unwell uh to have been in pain for so long um but that realization is also the moment where we have the opportunity to change things and to come back home so it was also really the beauty of reconnecting with myself and and probably seeing myself with love for the first time in my life.
it's really a chronic uh, situation um, for people, isn't it? Uh, especially in a place like London, especially in a kind of a competitive environment. A lot of people don't even realize that there's a, another way of functioning in the world that is more heartfelt, is more spiritual, is more loving. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and society doesn't support us to get out of that. So, and this is why I say the crisis is often the blessing because that's the you know the moment we wake we wake up is the moment that we can start making choices, conscious choices to get out, do something differently. So you um this was like a Kundalini uh, yoga uh, retreat that you did. Um... It wasn't even a Kundalini retreat actually. It was it was regular hatha. So I mean I wasn't expecting anything other than what I'd already experienced. But the teacher practiced Kundalini yoga for herself. So one day she just decided, oh, you know, let's do that chant that we do at the beginning of all our Kundalini classes. And so it was just, you know, that was, uh, I needed to be there at that moment to have that experience and to so, connect. And you, you uh, then continued to practice Kundalini in London regularly? Yeah. I mean, the funny thing was, was that over those previous six months, I had really tried every single yoga class I could find because my ac acupuncturist said you know try another teacher try another discipline try a different venue try a different this try a different that different time of day so I'd really done everything I could and uh, I'd never come across Kundalini never seen it didn't even know it existed and then after I went back after this holiday I went to the gym where I was going three four times a week and I was swimming and I'd done all of their yoga classes and you know I'd go for a bit of workout they had two Kundalini classes a week and I'd never seen them. <laughs> it, was, it was like, you know, somehow my eyes had to be closed to it until I could have that experience. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and the Kundalini teachers, I don't know if, if you've ever seen uh, Kundalini teachers or know much about the tradition, but we tend to wear white and we tend to wear turban as well. So we're pretty bloody obvious. Yeah. <laughs> we stand out in a crowd, you know. Yeah, so for the folks listening, this is going to be a little bit weird because we just kind of like uh, traveled through time into the future. Um, <laughs> because as we were discussing Kundalini Yoga, there was a massive nationwide power cut across Taiwan and we had to abandon our <laughs> first interview <laughs> attempt. So apparently yeah. uh, Kundalini is a powerful subject. And um, just to remind Sarah and I what we were talking about and carry the conversation forward, it was um, it was Kundalini Yoga and the development of a spiritual practice that led to uh, the healing of old wounds and health problems for you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think it wasn't long after that that you ended up traveling to Dahab for the first time, or did that happen already? No, that came. Uh, I think I'd been doing yoga a year, two years maximum when I came here for a week's holiday. So were you already a teacher at that time? I had just started teaching, yes. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I had a few classes and I had some private students and uh, yeah, it was picking up really, really nicely. Um, I decided I needed a week, a week's holiday before Christmas. Um, and I'd heard about this place called Dahab, some friends of mine who have uh, a yoga holiday company had sort of said, oh, there's this place, you know, you'd be a great group leader and this place is really cool and we think you'd really like it. And so when I was just looking around for a holiday for me, I thought, well, I can go and check it out. Before I'm a group leader, I kind of want to be there anyway, know my way around a bit. So I just booked myself on one of their holidays as a paying guest and um, arrived. Um, I came actually after the group they I think they flew in on the Saturday and I was teaching a workshop that weekend so I didn't arrive till Monday evening I didn't meet any of them and I just went for a walk and found my way around and um and I think because I hadn't been there from the beginning I was a little bit outside of the group and and that was fine I didn't gel so much with the yoga teacher or the style of yoga again you know <laughs> it wasn't kundalini and I was like okay here we go I'm bored um but on day three, there was a guy in the group um, who was, he was a real like action man. So he would do his yoga class and he would go kite surfing and then he would go horse riding. And he, you know, I mean, he was doing everything. Oh, totally. So I, one day I said, you know, I'd love to go for a horse ride with you. So he said, sure. Okay. So sunrise, you know, um, we can do like a long ride up to Blue Hole. Okay. 
So got up early and I was sitting on my horse, pottering up to Blue Hole. And it was, uh, I literally I heard a voice inside of me saying, you're home. And I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> what do I do about that? Um, I had, you know, I was literally, I was on a one week holiday. But uh, because of my yoga practice um, and understanding really what intuition is, I realized it was my intuition. So it was something that my soul was trying to tell me. Um, so I really felt that, okay, I need to be here for whatever reason that is. I don't know what it is. I can't see the big picture, but I'm going to trust. And um, I just made one promise to myself. Well, two promises. The first one was that I would not write a pros and cons list. So I would not sit down and go, well, financially it works. But on the other hand, my mom's ill and she's in the UK. And the weather's great, but I'm not going to be able to earn any money, you know, because I think when we go into that headspace, that intellectual space, that's where our fears are produced. And I would probably have found enough things to talk myself out of it. So I just thought, no, I've, I've heard this voice. I've, I know what it feels like. Um, and it feels like a, a profound truth for me. And so I'm just going to go with it. And I will have to work with my fears as I go along. And of course, there were times I would wake up in a cold sweat and just go, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> you know, I'm, leave I'm leaving the UK and I'm going to go live in a Muslim country and I don't know anybody. Um, the second promise I made, and that actually arose after I had moved to Dahab, was as long as I'm happy. That's really my base for making decisions. Am I happy? Am I not happy? Um, so again, moving away from all of the limiting beliefs about money and lifestyles and expectations and our society and all of that kind of crap. Um, and so in the end, I didn't go back home for Christmas. I stayed for a whole month just to give myself time to, you know, I mean, I did need to do a little bit of head work of how do you get a visa and, and is it easy to rent an apartment and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and it just, it was super easy, everything. So I was like, okay, this is a no brainer. I'm doing it. I flew back to England in January and two days after landing in London, booked my return flight because I could feel I was already getting sucked back in to the illusion of the West, but which was making me believe that Dahab had been the illusion. It's such a powerful energy that the West has created for itself that, you know, it teaches us to believe that anything outside of that illusion is the illusion whereas it's actually the other way around so it was not it was an easy time you know and and it was immensely pressurized to give up everything and get everything done to make that flight on the I think it was the 12th of March 2005 but I did it and uh, I came here sort of thinking yeah one year maximum two you know and then my adventure will continue and but then that will well, as long as you're happy. And so at the end of the first year, my freediving career started and, um, you know, and I was happier than I'd ever been. So it all kind of snowballed a bit. Yeah. So you were already uh, established in Dahab for quite a long time before, before freediving really showed up on the radar at all, right? Yeah. I mean, I'd, it was fairly soon after I arrived and, you know, I'd started my yoga classes and I had one of my students, a Canadian woman called Michelle. She may not be happy about me mentioning her because she's quite private. But she, we can I owe her name out if you like. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I owe everything to her, really, um, because she'd done her Aida Two Star and back then there were hardly any freedivers in Dahab and she so didn't have a buddy. Like, it wasn't like now where it's all you oh, can no. see around you. No, not at all. I mean, there was Linda and Lotta, and Linda's then boyfriend. They were kind of working together and running some courses. Is that, and Lotta that was pretty Erickson? Much... Erickson? Yeah, Linda, 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 Linda Paganelli and Lotta Erickson. Okay, yeah. So, who are Freedive Diehub and Freedive International. Back then, they weren't working together, they were doing their own things. So, they were really the only permanent freedivers. And then, you know, a couple of people. Did a, did a little bit of training with them or courses and you know it was it, it was really in the nascent days um just before free diving really took off so this girl michelle had done her aida two star and needed a buddy and was saying to me you know she came to yoga she said you know will you do pranayama and you love swimming and you know you might 
you might like it. You might even be quite good. And I was just like, no, nah, not interested. <laughs> and um, it took her a year. This is why I say I have a lot to thank her for, because she is so bloody persistent on some things. <laughs> She still she still lives here and she's a very very dear friend and she's she's now done the Kundalini yoga teacher training with me so she teaches alongside me and covers me when I'm away and, and vice versa. Um, but yeah, her persistence was in the end you know it was like water on a stone. <laughs> she mm, wore me down. Wore you down. Yeah, totally. And I said, okay, fine. Look, I can't listen to this anymore. I will do the Aida two star. Um, I'll get so that I'm competent down to 20 meters so I can do safety for you, but I'm really not interested in going any deeper. That's going to be it, you know. <laughs> and uh, I did the course and fell in love. It was really my my two star was the same moment of what the fuck just happened to me as that <laughs> first time tuning in with the with the mantra, the Ong Namo mantra that I mentioned that happened to me in Greece. And you lived, uh, did I see that you lived in... Uh... Um, just to sidetrack slightly here, but did you live in Holland at some point in the Netherlands? Oh, yeah, I did. Where about yeah. did you live? Um, totally landlocked in Wageningen, which is really as close to the center of the country as you can get in Helderland. And, um, but ironically, it's, the, it's, the, it's famous for the Agricultural University and the Maritime Research Institute. So they have these huge testing tanks. Um, and a lot of the big shipbuilding companies will have uh, to scale model um, of their of their new hull designs brought to these testing tanks, and you can put them in deep water testing and shallow water and manoeuvring and rough weather. And so, you know, we were as far away from the sea as you could get in Holland, but we had all of these men walking around in wetsuits most of the time. It was a very surreal place to live. <laughs> but how, how did you end up in Wageningen? Um, love. Oh. Yeah, classic <laughs> uh, classic answer. stories probably the only yeah. thing that would take you to a place like that really yeah do you know it well i lived in amsterdam for best part of 10 years so i'm pretty familiar oh, with wow. the netherlands yeah i thought if you lived yeah, in amsterdam yeah. for sure we would know the same people okay no i didn't i know i was country girl we lived in a windmill actually it was mm. very romantic yeah it, <laughs> i'm bloody it, bloody cold in winter yeah yeah i got something i don't miss that's for sure yeah, but, uh, mm -hmm. but I lived in Helsinki as well, so that then the Netherlands was like uh, balmy compared to that when I got back. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so you live in Egypt for a long time now. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm just interested, you know, about um what it's like to actually uh, live in Egypt. Of course, you know, the whole world was uh, aware of what was happening during the Arab Spring, and the situation in Egypt was televised, and uh, you know, you were still living in Dahab during that time, right? So, um, yeah. it, what you know, we have an impression, I guess, outsiders that Egypt would be a kind of a dangerous place to live. Um, yeah. Do you ever have that feeling or is that a million miles away for you? I have never once felt threatened either on the big scale, i.e., you know, the global political um, spectre of terrorism and anti-Westerners and all of that kind of stuff, or on a personal level, you know, the, the, the regular man, woman stuff that happens in Europe. Um, I have never felt safer anywhere in my entire life. And I find it a huge pity because um, I think there's a huge, huge error and irresponsibility on the part of the media and a part of the security consultants. Now, I, I mean, I don't know exactly how these, you know, decisions are made, but I was on a plane with a guy who rather indiscreetly told me that he worked for the for the for security basically reporting to the British government and when I told him I lived on Sinai he was absolutely horrified now he's based in Syria on the Turkey on the Syrian border in Turkey um, and it, he's in charge of a team of Syrians who are reporting on activities within Syria so I mean he you know he's pretty much as expert as you can get on these kind of situations. And I told him about, you know, I live on Sinai and he was horrified. And he said, you know, it's the most dangerous place in the world. And I could, you know, I could pick out, you know, the 20 most wanted terrorists and, you know, 
they're on Sinai at the moment. And, and I said, but they're on North Sinai, not South Sinai. And even he didn't know the difference. And he was unaware to the fact that North Sinai is, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's another country. It is so tightly cordoned um, and there is absolutely no movement between the North and the South. Um, and, you know, then when I sent him photos, uh, I mean, he was a very nice man. I sent him some photos and, and he Googled me and he had a look and he was like, oh, it looks really great. And I'm like, yeah, you should come and have a holiday here sometime. It's really relaxed. You know, I wouldn't be here if I felt it was dangerous. And certainly my friends with children wouldn't be here if they felt it was dangerous, you know. And every time that we've been through one of these dramas, you know, and it's really, it's been, it's been like a wave ever since I arrived because, you know, I got here early 2005, 2006, we had the bombs. Um, 2008, we had the shark attacks. 2010, you know, we had the Arab Spring. So it's it's literally every two years we go through, oof, here we go again. You know, tourism starts picking up. Oh, no, there we go. It's down again. Um, <clears throat> but it's every time something happens, I do see some people deciding to leave. A lot of those decisions are based on my children are 10 and they now need a decent education, which is I understand, and they would go anyway. Um but for me, it's really like, but this is home, you know, where else would I go? Um, I, it, it reaffirms that for, for whatever reason, I have very deep roots in this place. And um, I've never said it's forever and I never will. Uh, and there is a little bit of restlessness in me sometimes, but there is something about Dahab which really keeps me, keeps me here. Um, and it's beautiful. And um, let's just hope the Prime Minister is listening to this and she <laughs> puts the flights back on. <laughs> I'm sure the Prime Minister listens to all these uh, free diving podcasts. Right, episodes, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. She's, we're top of her podcast list. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, the way you talk about it and the way other people have spoken about it, like I usually ask my guests what their favorite dive sites and places to uh, to stay and dive are. And uh, Dahab's always, you know, at the top of the list. Um, uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, it's it's not just the great dive conditions. It's also the community that we have here now. Right. You know, and people can come to Dahab. They can rent a Bedouin house for like less than, a, you know, like 100 euros a month. You know, you can live like a king here for very little money. You can hop in a taxi. You can be at Blue Hole in 20 minutes. You've really got the best dive conditions. I mean, unless you're a plus 100 meter diver and you really want um, serious depth. Um, but, you know, you can still get that outside of the blue hole, but it's it's incomparable. And, and the community is great. You know, we've got we've got some amazing, healthy restaurants, vegan restaurant and, um, you know, whole food restaurants. And, you know, it really supports the free divers lifestyle. You know, we've got yoga classes. You know, I teach yoga meditation two to three times a week. There are other yoga teachers in town. There's we've got amazing massage therapists, physiotherapists, healers. Um, there is so much about the community, not just the water conditions that make Dahab just an awesome place to be. You started, um, you started free diving, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you started free diving at the age of 34 already, right? I don't want to uh, date you, um, but it wasn't, <laughs> you, you weren't, you, you didn't start me. young, it's right? Okay. I was not the one, one of the youngest, no. Yeah, it, yeah, it was 2006. So yeah, 34, absolutely. Mm. Right, so, and when you did the first course, um, you said there wasn't that many free divers there at the time. So you, you <laughs> could have done your first course with uh, Lotta Eriksson and her friend? I did, I did the first one with Linda. And I think there was four of us. There were a couple of tourists and me and another local girl on the course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you started, free, you, you were in Dahab for a year, you eventually <clears> started free diving. Um, you had some kind of, uh, it was a bit of an awakening for you when you had that first experience free diving. Um, were you then just completely obsessed by it and you were just trying to dive as much as possible? Did it kind of take over your life quickly? Um, yes and no. It was, it was different. So... As I mentioned, in 2006, we had um, the bombs, which again, the media was saying, oh, it's Al-Qaeda. It wasn't. It was an internal 
internal Bedouin versus Egyptian government thing. So anyway, we had we had the bombs. I was due to to do my Aida two star that day, and we were all a bit shaken, so we pushed it back a couple of days. Did the course, had the most amazing experience, loved it. Um, but then got busy with a support group because the Red Cross was not here and um, or they were here, but in in the Hilton Hotel supporting tourists who hadn't had anything to do with it. And all of the dive community, you know, the dive masters and dive instructors, we'd been there on the scene, you know, holding holding people's bodies together, literally trying right. to keep them alive. So just for anyone who's listening, who's not aware of this, because I did forget momentarily there, the bombings actually took place in Dahab, right? Not just in Egypt, but actually <clears throat> where you were. Yeah, we had, uh, yeah, we had one bomb attack. It was um, end of April, 2006, and it was uh, three sites along the bay. Oh. Um, and uh, it turned out to be Bedouin uh, sort of protesting against the Egyptian um, governance on Sinai. Um, and I think 27 people died, mainly Egyptians. There were sadly a few foreigners caught up in it, but it wasn't targeted at, at foreigners. So that was a sort of a big, um, it was drastically misconstrued in terms of, you know, what it was about. Yeah. So um, I got, I got, then got involved in a support group, just sort of creating a space for the Dahab locals who needed just to have somewhere there where they could talk and share. And I found myself getting a little bit depressed and, um, and, and I struggled a little bit when I lived in London with, you know, whether it was depression or, you know, this seasonal, seasonal winter blues or whatever it was, but it would, you know, it would sometimes take me months and months to get out of it again. And, um, and I thought, oh, God, you know, I can't go there. You know, I've been happy living in Dahab. I haven't felt this for a couple of years and I don't want to go there now. So I said to the girl who the other local who'd been on the on my beginner's free diving course, let's just go to Buhol. <clears throat> and I went there and it was literally we did a dive session. I came out and I was like, wow, I feel 50 percent better. That's amazing. Let's go again tomorrow. We went again and another 50 percent better, i.e. in two days, two dive sessions something that would have taken me months to work my way through in terms of, you know, feeling down and lethargic and struggling to find the positive uh, aspects of life, it was gone. So my start in freediving was simply, this makes me happy. Mm. So there's almost like that a easy, therapeutic dimension to it. Yeah, totally. And if it's that easy to be happy, I'll just go diving two, three times a week. And that was it. So there were no goals. There was no, uh, you know, I didn't set out with any grand plans at all. Um, and I, I think I had, I was doing that for four or five weeks, just having a lot of fun. You know, I was diving a lot with Linda and Lotta in their school. So whenever they had students coming in, you know, we would join them and go to Blue Hole and hang out. And you meet a lot of people and you, you know, it was really fun. Um, and then uh, I was diagnosed with hepatitis A. And boom, everything came to a rather dramatic so, I'm end. I'm not familiar with, uh, I mean, I've heard of it, but what, what does that entail, actually? How does that affect you, affect you as a disease? So, Hep A is it's a virus which, which attacks the liver, and um, it is oral transmission. So, it was in some food I right, ate. Okay. Um, if you really want the details, it's fecal oral transmission, which just Ooh. grosses me out completely. Yeah, it sounds yeah. delightful. Not nice. Um, <laughs> but it's not, you know, it's not the blood one. It's not the sex one. Right. So, um, so yeah, and uh, the the symptoms are very heavy flu like, um, and it's uh, it takes a long time to get over. The virus itself probably is a month. But then because it's attacked your liver, the liver is an organ that regenerates and you need a lot of energy to regenerate your liver. So I was back in London when it happened, went to see my acupuncturist and he was like, OK, you sleep. If you can't sleep anymore, you stare at the ceiling. If you can't stare at the ceiling, you maybe read a book, but you don't watch television. You don't walk anywhere. Nothing. He's like, you know, even watching TV is actually a stress on your nervous system. It's going to drain you rather than nourish you. Um, and it's going to take you six months to a year to go through this phase. And I was wow. like, oh my God, I'm going to be so bored. Um, 
So there was no yoga, there was no swimming, there was no diving, there was no walking the dogs, there was no riding my bike. I mean, it was really my life reduced. Um, and it was tough. And I stuck that for like six or seven months. And then I thought, okay, I'm going absolutely stir crazy here. There was a competition going on in early April 2007. And so I contacted Linda and Lotter. I said, you know, I have no idea. Maybe I'll get in the water. I'll do one dive and I'll be wiped out for the next six months again. But I need to try. So I just got back in and started, um, you know, just super gentle, easy dive session just to see how I felt. And I came out of the water and I was fine. Rested for like two, three days. I was literally, I'll do one session and then rest for a good few days and then do another session and rest for a good few days. And that started sort of towards the end of March with a view to this competition in early April. And my first competition dive ever, um, I did 30 meters no fins and got a British record. <laughs> nice. Nice. And, um, and so this approach, which came through illness of really resting more than diving, served me so well that I just continued. And uh, I, it's something that I really promote and, you know, people that have dived with me or been to presentations, you know, really know that I, uh, I'm super lazy actually. Um, <laughs> But it's, you know, I, I believe in the wisdom of the body. So when you do a dive, you've given your body all the information it needs to adapt, to get itself ready for that experience or, or a slightly expanded version of that experience next time around. So all of this, you know, nose clips on an exercise bike and pushing weights and cardiovascular work. Yes, it's great, but it's not necessary for deep diving. Because those are not the physical attributes the body necessarily mm. really needs. Yeah, it's for deep so hard diving. to specifically train deep diving physiology without actually just doing the diving itself, right? Yeah, dive deep. You know, training training is sport specific for everything. So you know, if you want to dive, dive. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know that that's very easy to say when you live in Dahab and you have the luxury of the blue hole twenty minutes away from your front door. For sure. Um, and people living in cities listening to this just go, yeah, right, shut up, Sarah. <sighs> you have no fun. Yeah. <laughs> you made me so jealous just the way you said that. <laughs> just <laughs> Yeah. Um so I you know, and I know that pool training has uh, has some benefits for breath hold, but really if you know, if you want to dive deep, find deep water as much as often as, as you can. And so that was really my premise of, you know, I do a dive and then, then I allow my body to do the rest. And then I do another dive and with that approach Every dive always felt easy, manageable. You know, I was never on a threshold of hypoxia or feeling exhausted or feeling like I was really, really pushing myself. Um, and and with that, you know, it's always like you're always walking through an open door, which feels very welcoming and um, comfortable. And, you know, from going from April through to October, which was another seven months, I suddenly found myself with three world records. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, without ever really having tried, I was just having fun. Mm. So, um, right. So your first competitive season, you, you, um, you, what, was it 11 British records that you got and three world records? I think so. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. So let's just, let's just backtrack a little bit because I mean, once we get to the, um, the point where you're breaking world records, we've missed out the, uh, the, the, the stage that got you there. So when you first started free diving, was there anything that was particularly difficult for you? Do you remember that there was something that was like, was it equalization or was it technique or was it fear, anxiety? Was there something like that which put a block on you at some point that you eventually got over? Like some kind of challenge that you overcame? No. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> no. Next. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I really, you know, I was diving with a lot of people during 2007 in particular equalization was always easy you know I had a funny moment when I started to learn the mouth fill in that you know I would go down and I would do my mouth fill and I would continue and I would suddenly just go ah, and come back and I remember diving with Lotta and I did this three or four times and um, <laughs> she said okay so look, what's going on do your ears hurt no are you still going down yes well, you're doing it right then. <laughs> but because um, because it was a new sensation, and I think the, the 
pressure of the mouth pill gave me constant pressure rather than the sequential equalization. You know, I wasn't getting the popping in my ears. I was like, something's not working, you know, something's wrong. But it was just that newness. And it took me, you know, maybe two dive sessions to suddenly realize like, oh, okay, I'm doing it right. Well, that's that's fine then. I'll just yeah. keep going then. So you just maybe um, like freaked out a little bit because like something that you were used to was taking out the equation and... Yeah, yeah, yeah I, just, I just didn't really... I didn't really understand what I was, you know, what I was doing and what that what I was doing was right. Um, and in terms of fear, really, I mean, my yoga practice was so useful um, in that because I'd learned how to self-analyze. And so rather than, you know, going down and freaking out and not knowing why I was freaking out, I, I remember I had one dive and I think it was my first time to 55. And I, you know, I got there fine, no worries, turned, came back, but I was really racing to the surface. And my safety diver, um, I remember it was uh, Natalia Avsenko, uh, she sort of said, oh, you look quite stressed. You know, what happened? Did something happen down there? Did you feel hypoxic? Um, were you scared of the tuna? <laughs> I don't know, you know, what, what could have happened? And, um, you know, and I listed these things off, very similar to the mouthfeel experience. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I was like, it was just my mind playing tricks on me. You know, I'm fine. So, you know, yes, our minds have the ability to create uh, some kind of reality for us. They create a situation which we believe is real and we respond as if it were real. But actually, it was just complete fantasy. My mind, just for whatever reason, you know, maybe it was because I was thinking, oh, maybe I'm going to see the arch today. My mind, you know, it its negativity flared and I followed it and because of my yoga practice because of my understanding of the mind I could see that process uh very very clearly and then I could just go well I, I'm just not going to let that happen again mm. simple yeah. once you and, see these and, things from uh from a kind of objective objective perspective yeah they just don't emerge yeah. anymore from the subjective perspective yeah. right so then I was like, okay, fine, I don't need to do that anymore. It's just it's just a game that my main, my mind's playing on me. And I never did, you know, and then I went plus 100 and I never got freaked out or scared or stressed on a dive ever again. So, <clears throat> and I think this is what allowed me to progress so quickly, you know, from that April to October, um, you know, all of my training buddies, you know, the ones that I, I was at the same level with at the beginning, or people who were either in a, ahead of me when I started, either I left people behind or I overtook or caught up with or overtook people, um, you know, and I, there were, <laughs> you know, they were, it was meant nicely, but people kept calling, you're a freak, Sarah, you're a freak, <laughs> you know, you should, like nobody else is doing this, you know, you should reach a point where you stop and you get blocked and you, and you, and you have to face shit like the rest of us, but for whatever reason, you don't. And it's not fair. Um, and that was when Will Winram nicknamed me Mighty Mouse as well. <laughs> so um, I was just, I mean, on the one hand, I would say I was lucky. Um, but I really feel I just had the blessing of access to these teachings, um, which gave me that ability to control my mind. And it's the mind which makes the biggest difference. Yeah, so like you... You already had the 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 psychological aspect of it was something that you already had the upper hand on before you even went into yeah. free diving. Even before you knew that it would play a big part in free diving, you were already um, it was it was easy for you to control the mind. Yeah, and I think you know with hindsight, I actually didn't realize what I'd been doing until I started coaching other people. Right. It was like, you know, I had this toolkit, which was always with me. And because it was such, it was, you know, it's just when something is always there and you're using it all the time, you take it for granted and you don't realize actually how profound an impact it's having. So it was when I started coaching other people and listening to their stories and seeing how caught up they were in their fears but it wasn't that they couldn't manage their fears. They didn't even realize that that's where they were stuck. 
You know, they were just looking at the technique, going, yeah, but how can I fix this? Do I just have to keep diving more? And it's like, no, you take a step back and you change your whole approach. You know, you can't fix this by pushing harder. The only way you can fix this is by softening and letting go yeah. almost. So it was really just through when I started coaching people and I saw the, my God, I mean, it, it's people's minds are a mess. <laughs> Sorry to say it, but it's it really, and it, you know, I never considered, you know, I remember, you know, when I set my world records and people, you know, journalists were going, well, how did you do it? And, 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 and I remember again, Will Winram saying, you know, when you look at her on the surface and she's breathing up, she has this amazing mental focus. And I was like going, me? Me? I'm just some dizzy blonde. No, I'm just having fun. I don't have mental focus. What are you talking about? But really then when I started coaching and I was getting inside other people's heads, I could then see, oh, you know, there's all this stuff which I take for granted. I call it my Kundalini backpack. It's like a toolkit and I can just, <laughs> you know, whoosh, whiz out my, you know, the, the tool that I need in the moment. Yeah, it's pretty handy to take underwater with you, isn't it? It's awesome. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I think like what you're saying about like most people's minds being a mess. I mean, you know, this is the so-called modern condition or the human condition, right? And the amazing yeah. thing about free diving is that, you know, you can live your whole life without realizing you have this, um, uh, you know, alarmingly uh, crazy psychological state. But then you, when you go in the water and you hold your breath and you dive down 10, 20, 30 meters, that's really a place where you're gonna really find out that you have those problems, right? It's um, yeah. eventually, you don't go deeper until you address them. No, exactly, so exactly. It, the, I think the potential is in there in free diving for, um, I mean, at least it's been my experience that uh, it's really turned a mirror on myself and I've, even though I thought I was very relaxed sometimes, you know, I was kind of, mm. I had a bit of a mask on and um, that mask yeah. doesn't work when you're underwater. <laughs> yeah, it's, exa it's exactly it's exactly how I see it. Um, yeah, the ocean is the most honest mirror that we, that we will ever find. And, um, you know, we can bullshit our way through lives. We can make excuses. We can blame other people for our relationships not working, for our jobs. We blame our parents. We, you know, we can blame all kinds of stuff. But when you're in the ocean on breath hold, it's just you, it's just you and your subconscious fears come to the surface and it's like, whoa, okay, I'm going to have to deal with this stuff. And, um, yeah, the, as you say, the mask is, is off. Um, and it's, but this is why I believe that people come who come to free diving get so passionate about it. It's because they are suddenly in a space where they see themselves for the first time and that's beautiful i mean it's touching it's profound you know free diving can be such a moving thing you know there's so many tears that can be released on the boy or under the water and um you know that beauty of suddenly realizing who you are it's you know it's like when i came to kundalini you know the tears it was like wow where have i been all my life but here i am and isn't it beautiful um and I think that this is um, free diving really has huge potential because it attracts people who might not necessarily come to a yoga class. Mm, right. Yeah. But they're they're getting the same lesson um, that they would get in a yoga class, and um, I think it transforms people so quickly. I didn't want to like, uh, you know, the way I think of it is like free diving is. Um kind of like a condensed or I don't want to use the word shortcut because it's a little bit maybe sounds too trendy or superficial but it really does uh, speed up the extent to which you can discover mm. a spiritual aspect in your life especially yeah. if you're averse to religion you're averse to chanting you're averse to you know the myriad you know one million different forms of spiritual expression that mm. there are free diving is so mm. simple you know it's uh take a breath you dive down and you find it all out you find it all out without asking for it or having to read any books so uh, i think it's amazing mm -hmm. yeah yeah so when, absolutely. when you um when you were because because you progressed so quickly in the beginning do you ever remember at that point um anyone saying to you that maybe you were going too fast mm, no because i never had a squeeze and i never was hypoxic at all um so 
you know, I was always very comfortable on my dives. You know, I was, I was, I never took any big risks. I was never, um, I was never pushing hard. So, and I think that that was very clear to people. You know, I was, you know, I was conservative. My, my depth progression was two meters at a time. Um, so no, no, you know, I mean, if I, if I had a student, I mean, I've had people then come to Dahab and, uh, you know, be frustrated with their coach or whatever and come and chat to me and yeah but you know and they're holding me back and I'm like well there must be a reason why they're holding you back why you know do you have any targets do you have any goals and and eventually over the course of this conversation it might come out well yeah I want to do 100 meters in three months but so did you (laughs) and um so then I'm kind of like okay well I step back you know the my experience is my experience. It needs to be taken in context. And, you know, maybe my body has a higher degree of natural flexibility. Um, my mind was already trained. Um, I was living here, so I was highly adapted. Um, you know, I would say the, the one thing that I did, which, and, and it was a genuine mistake in training, uh, I was, it was two weeks before the triple depth competition, which is where I did my three world records. And I was going for 73 meters and the the world record then in constant weight was 88. So I was way off, you know, there was no way I was even contemplating having a pop pop at them that year. Um, So I set my rope and, you know, I'm doing my 73, which, you know, I'd, I'd done I think I'd already done 75, but I'd been away. And so I was building back up to 75. And um, <clears throat> on the free fall, everything's fine. Just thinking, oh, you know, it feels like a slightly long dive, but I'm okay. You know, I'm checking in my ears, my chest. Everything feels fine and relaxed. Touch the bottom plate, swim back up. Yeah, it feels like a long dive, but I'm okay. And my legs tired? Yeah, a little bit, but, you know, okay. So I can kick more with my core or I can kick more slowly or I can... Uh, you know, smaller amplitudes or whatever, you know, playing around with it, get to the surface and, um, and my safety diver is super stressed and, and <laughs> nearly backing out. And, um, you know, once she's got her breath back and uh, we're, we're chatting and I said, yeah, I don't know, it felt like a slow dive. I had no idea why, you know, everything was normal. I don't know if I was out of alignment on my free fall or what happened. but And then I looked at my computer and I was like, whoa, I did 83. <laughs> so I genuine 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 mistake I set my rope to 83 rather than 73 Mm. um the reason I could do that dive with no squeeze and no blackout was because in my mind there was zero stress because I was doing a dive that I'd already done before um you know I mean I'll talk about I've I've spoken to Dave King about the accident he had in Kalamata in 2011 where he set the plate a lot deeper than his PB um, and was very close to being the first fatality that we ever had in competition. Um, And um, that was because he knew he was attempting 102 and his PB of the year before was 93 and his PB of that year was uh, 85 or 87 or something. So he knew that he was attempting, um, he, he was taking on a great deal of risk. And because of that, his mind would, his body would have held some tension over and above the fact that he was asking his body to adapt to a degree of pressure that probably wasn't ready for. So I, you know, and I, after his, after his accident, I had people throw it back in my face, but you did it. And that makes me really, really angry because I didn't do it. I never, ever, ever would set my rope more than four four meters maximum five meters deeper than my pb you know when we're getting into the 90 plus where the pressure difference is so much less um i would never set my rope much much deeper on purpose so uh that was an error i mean in the end it was what enabled me to attempt those three world records and pull them off at that competition um but it was not premeditated yeah. at it, all. It and sounds like it was anybody... just a, um, it was a, a lucky fluke in a sense, but it, it opened totally. up a gate to you that you were yeah. able to pass through up to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, I see that a lot of my freediving career has somehow been 
divine guidance and you know maybe it was like come on you you know you're going to do these world records this year stop pissing around with two meter increased <laughs> depths and it was god setting my rope a little bit deeper and just giving me the opportunity to experience uh what i really was capable of doing that was um so 2007 you did these world records um just run us through what were the world records at the time actually that you um achieved so uh, I did 90 meters constant weight, which was uh, an 88 on setting, beating the 88 meter. I did 81 free immersion, which was at 80. And I did 56 no fins, which had been 55. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, that's like uh, 90 meters in constant weight. It's, it's 10 years and it's only, it's only progressed a little more than 100 meters, which mm. was quite incredible. Mm. 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 Yeah. And yeah, the women's the women's dive scene has has moved quite slowly and I haven't really understood why that has been because there are some girls out there who are so strong and I mean, you know, they've shown their colours this year, um, at Vertical Blue, Hanako and uh, Alessia. Um, but you know, Natalia um Natalia Zarkova, there we go, that's the one I'm thinking of. Um my free diving career was very stop start. Um, so 2007, I did my world records. 2008, my mum died. 2009, I set my fourth world record, attempted 100 twice, but I really was not mentally ready to be doing those dives. And uh, so blacked out on both the 100 meter attempts. 2010, uh, I... I just had a breakdown. Everything became too much. 2011 was my year of just going, okay, I remember freediving made me happy. Where did I get lost? You know, how did, how did I lose that along the way? So 2011 was no goals, no records, no numbers, just joy. I'm going down to the bottom plate to touch my joy. And that's how I did the 104. So, you know, my career was one year on, one year off. And once I got to the 104, and I did that, and it was a very much a personal experience. It was not a record. It was not to to do anything other than for me to express something within myself. It was a it was a form of completion. And uh, then I stepped away from competitive diving. And then it was Natalia. And you know, if nobody's going to challenge your records, was that 104 meters in, in which discipline? Sorry, constant weight. 104 and constant weight. So, yeah. um, I thought Alessia Zaccini did 103 or 104 this year, and that was a she world did, record. Yeah, yeah, she did. Mine, it, as I say, it was just a training dive. Oh, okay, right, okay. Oh, well, you got to yeah. get back out there, Sarah. Come on. No, just this lacking. is what everyone says. No, this, <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to play that game. It's uh, for me, it was a personal thing to do, and it was a completion. And um, and I, you know, you can keep keep chasing the numbers forever or you can reach a point inside of yourself where you're content and you know for yourself that you've done what you sort of set set out to do um and I also f had a realization that the records in themselves are meaningless they're very nice you know and they're they're great for the sport because they keep they keep us moving forwards and they keep us exploring but on a personal level they're quite empty um, and I realized that my diving is much more about joy and it's about this spiritual discovery and that my, I think the whole purpose in me having had these quite remarkable experiences was to teach. And so this is really my focus now. I've stepped away from competition and I'm, I'm coaching and I'm teaching and I've created my videos and, um, you know, there's more stuff coming, uh, from that. So and also, I mean, this isn't something I've spoken about much in the public domain, but I have an illness called ulcerative colitis, which is a stress-related digestive illness, so like an IBS type thing. Um, and one thing I found was when I was diving deep, it got really activated. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as I could still do those deep dives, um, I could feel that they were taking a lot out of mm -hmm. my physical body. Bit of a price to pay and for that, to continue that kind of training. Yeah, exactly. And so I was like, okay, so the the payoff here is it worth it? No, actually, I I I need to honor my body more. Um, I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting illness because I've spoken to other top free divers who also get similar symptoms. Um, and if we look at Chinese medicine, the lungs and the large intestine are on the same energy channel, 
So um, I think somehow the, the pressure that we put the lungs under when we free dive can take a toll on the large intestine if there's maybe a pre-existing weakness mm. there or something. Yeah. I would I would love to do some work with Chinese uh, medicine uh, Chinese doctors and find out more about that connection because I've always had a had an intuitive sense that there's much more to the process than we really understand. Like I don't know if you know about Rosita Dangman's um, research that she got published by the Harvard Business Review no, this I'm year. Not aware of this. Um, it's only just published, so it's it's maybe not completely public domain yet, but she really has um, connected all of the dots within the physiological process of free diving. Um, and um, it's a lot to do with an adrenal release, and a, it's, it's a hormonal thing rather than um, simply being a CO2 um, and a uh, low O2. Um, I, she's, she's the expert, and it's a it's a remarkably complicated model that. But uh, that she she presented it to the Harvard um, Harvard I think medical school, and they tested every single one of those connecting points along the um, along the pathway that she had mapped, and um, said that. And they were like, we have no idea how you got here, but yes, you're right. She's actually a vet a horse vet but she uses Chinese medicine to treat animals and but she's a free diver and then so she started applying her knowledge of um, acupuncture in the animals to what she was experiencing and what she was sensing in the water through her own free diving so she's brilliant what, what is her name Rosita Dangman right. she's a German yeah I'm sure we've yeah. um, we've talked about her on the show before because I remember imagining a, a woman throwing a horse into a into deep water to do some uh, <laughs> research to or something out. but I've, I've forgotten mm -hmm. the exact details obviously um yeah. but um yeah I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna look that up and get as much information as i can on that so i mean like it's as far as the dive response is concerned you know there's a deeper level and deeper and deeper layers yeah. that we have to uh understand before we can really get a grip on the whole thing there's so much that we don't know about in this sport and um it's it's fascinating, but you know my sense was uh, free diving triggers my illness, um, and as much as you know my 104 felt pretty easy, and it was um, my equalization was really the only limiting factor in my depth on that day. Um, I also reached a point of it's enough. I'm I'm happy and I'm content, and I feel that you know it's now time to go out and share to a broader audience what I've. Um, what I've experienced, which is what the videos are all about, really. It's really great that you feel happy and that you feel satisfied with what you achieved and that you don't feel the need that you don't feel like you're missing out on anything and you have a really mature um, attitude about it. And obviously now you're ready to, you know, like move on to another level and express your free diving wisdom mm -hmm. on a, uh, to a different platform in a different way. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get on to that. Um, there was just one thing I wanted to talk to you about regarding that time. I mean, there was a there was a time when you um, uh, you were basically exchanging records with Natalia Molchanova, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, Natalia Molchanova is a I'm sure pretty much everyone who will listen to these podcasts will know who she is. But mm. do you remember? Did you know her as a person? Did you talk to her much? Um, is there? Do you have some memory of her? And how was that time? Was that was that an antagonistic time for you when you were? in that situation or was it a, a joyful time for you? Um, I mean, I, I would say I was never really close to Natalia, but more because of a linguistic barrier than anything else. Um, uh, I remember seeing her before, I think it was back in 2006 before I really, you know, I was literally just, you know, a beginner baby in, in free diving. And I went to watch, I think it must have been triple depth um and i remember seeing herbert do 90 meters in the blue hole which was the maximum depth and i remember seeing natalia she attempted i can't remember what her dive was but it was no fins and she blacked out and that was the first blackout that i ever saw and i remember being really emotional about it because i didn't understand what a blackout was and i didn't understand that actually you know it's the body protecting her and she's fine <clears throat> so that was sort of my first 
actually she was att- that's exactly what she did she was attempting 56 meters no fins which was then my world record a year later so we so we kind of had this uh we had this bond without ever really connecting i know from other people that you know when i in 2007 when i set these three world records out of nowhere um she was i remember she was the first person she had this luminous yellow mask and she was the first person on all three records to come up and give me a hug in the water hmm. and i was really surprised because i was like wow i i didn't expect that i would have expected her to be standoffish or pissed off or whatever but she was she was really she was she was the first person there um and i was very touched by that i was also quite amused when i heard from russian friends that she was then running around in the background going who the hell is she and what does she eat and how does she train and how did she do we never even heard of her where she come from um so she was a bit freaked out um and then i i think over the years you know there was a huge amount of mutual respect um and as i got to understand more about her i just i saw beyond you know this russian machine label that mm. you know she was given she had the softest heart you know I remember one time we were training side by side in Blue Hall and I don't know if we had students or we were just training for ourselves. But anyway, you know, we were very much aware of each other's presence. And then somebody had brought their dog to Blue Hall and the dog just swam over and both of us were like, yay, we can play with the dog in the water and ditched our training and ditched our students and we're just swimming around in Blue Hall with this dog and we couldn't communicate. But for both of us, it was like, this is the most joyful way to be in the water is with animals and with children. And um, she and I both really shared that. And I think we, we saw that um, kindred spirit in each other. Um, <clears throat> and I was super, super fortunate to interview her and Alexei the day she set her last world record. Um, and it's a video interview, which is on my, on my uh, website mm-hmm. yeah, or on Facebook. That, yeah. Um, and, you know, and it, it was, again, you know, my cat jumped straight up onto her lap and just didn't move for the, for the entire interview. Um, and that was a, that was a moment where, uh, that was probably our closest connection was sitting together and, and having that informal chat in my garden. And that was the last time I saw her. The most amazing athlete, you know, I don't think we'll ever see anybody like her again. She had such strength of body and strength of mind together, and that combination is just as it was. It was unstoppable. For you personally, have you did you ever have a really bad accident yourself? I mean, you've already said that it was pretty uh, uneventful for you in the progression to to the, the top of your game. But did you ever have a really bad accident yourself, or did you ever see somebody else have one that made you stop and think about it for a second? That you know, did you ever did that put the fear into you? Let's say. Um, personally, I had how many blackouts? Three blackouts, but they were all they were all surface or one meter from the surface. Um, and I actually found them pleasant. I went into I went into some quite lovely dreams of being surrounded by men and you know them whispering sweet nothings to me and then you know waking up going. Oh, I am surrounded by. I hope that doesn't springs. happen to me. Yeah, <laughs> you never know. You might enjoy it. They were lovely. It was all the Italian team in Charm. Um, so my my blackouts were never stressful or traumatic. Um, but I am I was never the kind of athlete who could have a blackout and then get in the water again the next day. I needed time to process it and make sense of what had happened and and. Um, take a a good few steps back and build up again. Um, In terms of things that happened, you know, that I witnessed or saw, there was one, yeah, there was one um, incident. I mean, in itself, it was not, uh, it was not the worst accident that I ever saw, but it was with a student and we were, we were training together in March and it was our first day in the water on the way to Blue Hole. And I was just checking in with the group. So, you know, what are your warm ups normally? What do you plan to do today? You know, how many warm ups are you going to do to what depths? And then what's going to be your target dive if you have a target dive, even for your first day? And one of the guys, 
uh, you know, everyone was like, yeah, I'm going to do a few hangs at 10 and then maybe 15 and then go to 20, 25. And then that's, you know, I'm, I'm cool with that for the first day. And one guy just said, I'm going to do 69 meters. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to go for 69. And I was like, why? Well, that was, you know, my PB from last year. And I said, yeah, but that was last year. You know, you need time to warm up and readapt. And yeah, but no, I've been uh, training in the pool and I've been doing lots of empty lung stuff and stretching and I'm adapted and I'm ready to go and I'm ready to do it. And I was like, uh, no, I really, you know, I don't feel comfortable with this. Anyway, he was pushing, pushing, pushing. So I said, okay, so what are you going to do to warm up for this dive? Oh, no, nothing. Just one shot. And I was like, no, I, you know, I really don't want you to do this. And he was insistent. Um, it was a lesson for me as a coach that I need to be more insistent <laughs> sometimes. Um, and I maybe wasn't confident enough in myself. I mean, he was also a very experienced freediver. So part of me was like, well, you know, who am I to say? Anyway, he did the dive, actually. No warm up, straight down to 69, came back. Had a, had a minor blackout on the surface, but he was blue for about five minutes. He could not reoxygenate himself. Um, refused to breathe oxygen on the surface. Was super, super stubborn. Um, and from what I heard, even years later, was squeezing at very shallow depths. And he'd really, he'd given himself, a, I think, a permanent lung injury or certainly a lung weakness. And... Um, that was a big shock for me. And also, of course, Dave King's accident in 2011 at Cal in Kalamata, you know, when she, he announced 102. And, um, I mean, he also did the dive, blacked out at 10 metres, but he was out on the surface for a long, long time with a severe laryngospasm. And, you know, we thought he wasn't going to breathe again. Yeah, it must be pretty so, horrific to see, to witness uh, at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I'd announced 102 on that same day and I was due to dive like 10 minutes after him. So, of course, I got to witness all of that, all of the blood that was coming out of his lungs and, you know, thinking he was dead. And I got in the water for my countdown and I think I got to 24 meters and I was like, I don't have to do this. Why? You know, what am I doing? You know, it's a competition. It's fun. I'm here with friends. Um, and that that competition, which came directly after my 104, where everyone was like, going, wow, Sarah's going to kick Natalia's ass again. Um, everything was thrown very sharply into perspective. That was also the year when Mikkel Rizian lost his line and um, came up on my boy, came up on my rope uh, two minutes before my official top for my last dive, which would have been a pre-immersion world record. And um, it was really, I mean, that whole competition for me was, you know, I set out at the beginning of 2011 saying no records, no titles, no numbers, just joy. Having done the 104, which was just joy, I went to the World Re World Championships and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I can easily do another two world records. No fins, not so easy for me, but, you know, I can do free immersion and constant weight, no worries. And um, and universe is wonderfully supportive <laughs> in reminding you of your, of your intention. And it kicked my ass, you know, Dave King's blackout just ahead of my 102 attempt and Mikkel Rizian come up, coming up on my line two minutes before my official top. Um, and I, I clocked up a remarkably spectacular 100 and, minus 183 points or something at that competition. I think it was the most minus points ever, anyone's ever had. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that it uh, kicked somebody else's arse and not yours. Uh, that's probably the best way to find out that it's not your day, right? Well, I mean, who, whoever's ass gets kicked, I think as long as we all learn from it, you know, because none of us is immune and none of us is separate from all of this. And I think, you know, it's, it's when we get into the mistakes of uh, thinking, you know, thinking that we're somehow um, immortal, you know, and I, I mean... It's, it's, you know, it's a sad time in freediving at the moment. We lost Steve Keenan a few weeks ago. And I think, you know, he was such an amazingly strong diver. But, you know, maybe there was uh, a part of him which he'd done. He'd done some ridiculously spectacular safeties for people. And maybe part of him which forgot, um, you know, we're all mortal and we're all fallible and, and we all have a we all have a limit somewhere. Um so, you know, the, the sport is not without risks. We are 
I mean, we're super lucky that the risks are minimal and, um, you know, we have an incredible track record of safety. Um, yeah, there is a good record, isn't there? I mean, I think it's, um, it's tempting to, you know, in light of what has happened in the last few weeks and, you know, there's been a, quite a few cock-ups at the competitions in the last few years as well mm -hmm. uh, in terms of safety. Um, but it is a good record and uh, it's a young sport, so... Compared to compared to other disciplines or other sports, uh, I think free diving, especially the, just the nature of the people who are involved in the sport, they're very mindful people generally, mm. aren't they? But yeah. uh, maybe with someone like Stephen Keenan, you know, like he was just so good, and uh, he not only forgot he forgot his the limits of his abilities, but the people around him maybe never crossed their mind that something could happen to him, so it wasn't in the yeah. forefront of their minds either. Yeah, who does safety for the safety? Yeah, so um, you know, I think I think the one thing that we always, always, always have to learn is that we have to learn. Um, you know, we remember that none of these incidents are isolated, and it can happen to any of us. Um, and this is why transparency is so important, and also that there's a there's a there's a difficult. Um, balance to be found within the industry and I think it's something that it's a big challenge that AIDA faces is that um, making people responsible but without um, creating scapegoats and pointing the fingers because I've seen it in a few instances that without having the full facts people love to jump to conclusions and blame people and um, the more transparency that we can have when there are big accidents. And I think, you know, as much as Facebook is a pain in the ass, um, it's good that people share things. Like yesterday I was reading a post about some guy called Yeroon who's who's a paddy and CMAS scuba instructor and is out there teaching free divers um, and getting them to breathe off second stage regs of scuba divers who happen to be hanging out at 20 meters watching them. And he's getting his students bent and it's just like, fuck, you know, we need that transparency so that people are aware and so that people like him can't continue to to perpetuate dangerous, dangerous practices. And if accidents do happen, what was the reason? Um, there does need to be a certain amount of personal responsibility in that. And I think that's also something that people find a little bit difficult. But, you know, we have to also accept we're human, we're fallible, we make mistakes. And rather than really be aggressive and, and nasty in our finger pointing, the people who recognize <clears throat> that they made an error of judgment say, hands up, I got it wrong. Um, you know, and I think that there were possibly some holes in Stephen's uh, plan for Alessia's blue hole. Chinks in his armor somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I think they missed a few stages in the in the planning yeah, and right, preparation the preparation. Had to go yeah. through. So, um, you know, and I but I think Steve would be somebody he's probably up in heaven going, Oops, fucked up a bit there, guys, didn't I? Mm. Um But I mean the report's gonna be out, so uh I don't want to jump to any conclusions. Yeah, we'll we'll I find out about it and um <clears throat> the uh topics raised that we can discuss. Yeah. Um yeah. You know, I mean, in Nemo 33, when it opened, one of the scuba safeties, you know, who's sitting there at his 10 meters watching free divers go up and down, up and down, up and down. And at the end of the day goes, well, that looks easy. I'm going to have a go and jumps in on his own and oh, is no. found dead at the pool in the morning. And then Nemo 33 is closed to free divers for a good few years. Mm. Um, and there was also, uh, I, I think Linda Paganelli raised it on Facebook last year. There was some British guy who'd done an AIDA two star or something, was very good at marketing and had created this whole online program. Teach yourself to go to 10 meters without an instructor. Oh, geez. You don't need an instructor. You don't need somebody to take. You just need to follow these simple steps <laughs> online on my course. 10 meters. Hello. That's the biggest pressure change. That's where shallow water blackouts happen. So and yes. And he got jumped on by the whole community as well. So and Linda's great at at. Um, Pulling up, pulling up things like that. Yeah, I mean that's uh, if there's one sport where you don't want to uh, learn online, surely it's uh, yeah, you know yeah. Like, and that's you know that's one thing that I'm so super clear about with my online training. It's like this is not a replacement for getting in the water with an instructor. This is a complementary 
um, course to help you work with your mind and support what you're doing in the water with your instructor. Mm. So, um, yeah, and I think we have a collective responsibility. Like you said, you know, who are you to go and speak to whoever the authorities might be um, to raise concerns about an organization that looks sketchy? Well, if you don't, then who's the next, you know, clueless non-free diver who rocks up and goes, well, this looks great and ends up, you know, having a bad experience and possibly drowning. So, yeah, so I think we do have we have a collective collective responsibility. What I see now in in Dahab, which is <clears throat> which is worrying, but it's maybe a natural consequence of a sport which is growing so fast, is that, um, you know, if the sports get sport gets regulated and, and specifically in open water, how is that going to look? Because if it means that any freediver who wants to get in the sea can only get in the sea with long fins uh, by paying to go through um, uh, a school, you know, like an yeah. AIDA or an SI school or whatever, um, how is that going to restrict the sport? You know, a, one of the big parts of freediving is simply... It's recreational yeah, snorkeling. The freedom, right? That's and what free diving is about, the freedom. Exactly. So, you know, what what's actually happening in Dahab at the moment is that all of the free diving instructors are coming together to say what makes sense for us, A, for the sport and for maintaining a good reputation for sport, but also for the spirit, the spirit of free diving as it is in the spirit of our community, which is, we welcome people from all over the world to come and use the blue hole and to come and dive in the bay and to take advantage of the amazing um, facilities and natural environment that we have without it getting squashed down and becoming a financial thing. So, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a very difficult balance to, to find you know, what works for us, what works for the visiting free divers, what works for the authorities as well. Um, so I think we're in an interesting time, um, certainly here in Egypt, and, and I would expect that whatever may or may not happen here will eventually um, will eventually happen elsewhere in the world. Yeah, I was just literally um, two hours ago talking to uh, Jean-Paul Francois, who's the head of IDA Education, yeah, um, yeah, I know, JP. Yeah, we discussed this point exactly, you know, that it's a kind of a minefield that they have to travel through and, you know, the, it, it's a non-profit organization, but, it, you know, at the rate things are growing, um, some changes will have to occur um, mm. in terms of, um, you know, the status of the organization and how it's uh, how the system works. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I mean, I think, like, uh, I've got pretty good faith in the, in, the, in the free diving community to make the right decisions and, uh, if it looks like it's going the wrong way, you know, <laughs> fortunately we have that social media. So everyone's going to get up and uh, and make the voices heard about it. So hopefully it'll go yeah. in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you were talking a little bit about um, just to like move move away from the doom and gloom. Um, yeah. You were talking Please. about the uh, uh, your what you're doing now. Um, so you're the founder of Discover Your Depths, right? Can you tell us what Discover Your Depths is and what it, what's involved and, and what you're doing these days? Mm. Um, Discover Your Depths is really, it's about transformation. So as much as, uh, yes, I teach people to free dive and I help them, you know, um, expand their potential in the water. It's, um, it's about the transformation that has to happen inside of them for that to happen. And the thing that really excites me is when people are able to join the dots between them letting go of their fear in the water and how that is going to play out then for themselves in other areas mm, of their lives. Their life, yeah. Yeah. Um, so discovering your depths is it's much more a metaphorical um, journey than necessarily a physical journey. So, you know, if, if I, you know, go back to the teachings of Kundalini Yoga, one of our core mantras is Sat Nam. Sat Nam, Sat Truth and Nam Identity. So I am truth. So the way that I understand this and where I teach is, you know, each one of us is born with a blueprint already inside of us for our ultimate potential. And that could be, you know, the world's greatest free diver. It could be becoming an amazing scientist. It could be being an incredible mother. Um, you know, and, and it's not we're not just limited to one thing. 
but we have potential to expand ourselves in many, many different ways. But because of the conditions and the society and our family and our upbringing and our beliefs, we tend to follow well-trodden paths and stay within the confines of society and other people's expectations. Yeah, all our limitations are self-made really, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm really looking to doing is, is to kind of, you know, blow people's minds open to the fact that, hang on, you know, what you're doing right now, that's not you. It's a small part of you, but that's not everything. Um, and, and to look beyond all of that and, and start to start to have the courage to do the stuff that, you know, deep in their hearts they want to do and they know they can do, but they're just so trapped by, um, by the constructs, um, of the mind. So my teaching is, is, um, much more along those lines and it's, my free diving is always based very strongly on the on the yogic teachings as well, and my yoga feeds off my experiences in the water. So the the two things are very much hand in hand. So discover your depths is um is is it like a, um the people come to see you? Is there like a retreat or like a holiday or some kind of course? How does it how does it work? Um, I'm, I would say I'm probably in a bit of a transition zone at the moment, but uh, typically I've run two uh, training weeks, like a training camp uh, every year, uh, normally in spring around May time, and um, but with a with a very limited number. I don't believe I don't believe I can deliver what people need to receive if there's a big group. Mm -hmm. So I keep the numbers small. And then outside of those weeks, I do um, sort of on request bespoke stuff. Um, and that has really been the core of my teaching. You know, somebody will contact me and say, you know, I want to come and study with you for a week or a month or however long it is. Um, and we spend a lot of time in the water and doing yoga and in the mountains and, you know, looking at life um, and helping them to understand their mental makeup um and to go beyond to go beyond what they perceive as, as their restrictions as i say we're in a, a li little bit of a transition period at the moment um so having launched the videos um i'm looking for the videos to become the basis for f for additional training um courses that i that i am developing and my work, I also travel quite a lot. So I'm actually in September, I'm in Belgium at Nemo 33, actually doing the Manage Your Mind program with, I think, 24 freedivers um, and do, doing two evening presentations. Um, I, I was in March earlier this year doing a yoga workshop, but primarily for freedivers. Um, so it, it, it's quite varied. I travel to, to do these workshops mainly without water as an element but the Nemo you know offers that opportunity to get people wet as well <laughs> and um, put it into practice and yeah and here in Dahab I teach yoga um, I run teacher uh, a teacher training program for Kundalini yoga um, and yeah I'm looking to see how we shape things moving forwards whether you know we offer a few more camps and retreats uh, or whether we continue on the bespoke line, or, or how that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not quite yeah. uh, it's not quite a fully fully formed concrete thing. It's not still in a kind of organic um, yeah. fledging yeah. fledgling phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not something I can really talk about yet. Yeah. So I'm yeah, I mean, you also did a few videos which you uh, you did under the name of uh, Legends of Freediving, which were really nice mm. um, video interviews. Um, was yeah. that something that just petered out or is it something that you'll continue again uh, later in the future? Um, I would like to continue to do it and um, the I mean there's certain limitations of you know uh, my cameraman and him being here and athletes being here and um, you know the logistics just pure logistics of organizing it all um, the doing those videos was a little bit tied into doing the yoga for free diving videos, which is why we sort of did that run off them and, and um, haven't done any more. Um, and since then, I've been very focused, you know, launching the videos has taken up a lot of time. Um, 
so once we go through this, um, we get through this restructuring phase, then yeah, I would like to put some more videos out there. It's a fun project. I really enjoy doing it. And it's great. I mean, like you're doing now with me, it's great to connect with people and um, pick their brains and offer something to the free diving community. You know, for me, it was like I, I, it was me sitting with friends and, you know, sort of my peer group, you know, the top three divers and, and, you know, allowing people a peek into our, our friendship and our private lives a little bit, you know, like earwigging um, on us having coffee together. Well, it's funny you should say that because that's exactly what this is meant to be. Um, it's, yeah. That's why it's called the Free Dive Cafe, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you steal my idea? <laughs> well, no, it's funny you should say that actually because I didn't. And then I think like, uh, I just, you know, I love, I love podcasts and I love free diving. And I was just like, my, is no one going to do a free diving podcast? And I'd seen yeah. your videos, but I hadn't really like put two and two together. Uh, yeah. And then eventually I did. And then I was like, oh, like Sarah, like Sarah Campbell was essentially like there. Um, and and yeah. I, I kind of see, I think I kind of see like myself, you know, if I'd love to put more effort and energy into this and I'd love to have uh, video media as well. And um, because I think that what the free diving community is missing is like is a bit more media that's outside of just like Instagram photographs and Facebook videos. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, yeah. But I think that considering that we're essentially the only two people doing it, we don't have to worry so much about like a, a too competitive <laughs> environment for <laughs> free diving <laughs> interviews, you know? Yeah. <laughs> We can still both go through everybody and it's it's not going to get too old, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and if you ever, uh, the next time you see Umberto Palazzari and uh, Will Winram, uh, please tell them that they have to come on the show because... Um, okay. Uh, those guys have been slack and they haven't, uh, applied, they haven't replied to my emails yet, so, you know. Okay. I'll give them a gentle nudge for you. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, we're we're in the water a lot of the time. Um, I'm pretty sure that you're just like me. Every time in the water, you see some plastic floating by. Um, you visit a dive site um, five years apart. You notice that half the coral is dead, something like this. And um, obviously, the oceans are under a huge amount of pressure right now. Um, situation is yeah. pretty grim, and uh, not just in some yeah. places, but almost in most places. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, do you have any ideas about? Um, what is necessary to turn the tide? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on ocean conservation and what we can do? Yeah, it's a huge problem, and um, I don't think there's an easy solution. I think solutions are coming. I think awareness is constantly growing. Um, you know, there is regulation now to ban the micro pearls in cosmetics and face scrubs and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, it's totally unnecessary um you know that's a it's a very small part of the problem but as long as regulation is moving in that way and recognizing then it will also start to expand out from that as a starting point um there are more and more um solutions being uh, invented or you know alternative solutions to plastic um and there are more and more communities which are going plastic bag free uh, although of course you know I mean it's it's one drop in the entire ocean of uh, communities that are doing that so it's not nearly enough really and it needs to come from above as well as from below so you know we the the aware ocean lover uh, can um, <clears throat> can create pressure from below but as long as you've got assholes like Trump saying climate change doesn't exist um, uh, you know and totally totally reversing any um, positive steps that have been made towards ocean conservation or environmental conservation in general um, we you know we we're really fighting an uphill battle um, uh, so it's you know the political landscape needs to change uh, we're in a, in a really really time now and you know often you know coming from a in, you know being within the yogic environment you know you think wow you know everyone's so conscious and loving and aware and da 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 and then you kind of turn on the television and you go oh my god the world out there is a mess 
And <clears throat> I think one thing that we often talk about is that um, the universe is somehow always in balance. And we are moving towards a, a, a stage of, of being strongly out of balance and destroying the oceans and destroying the rainforests. And, um, but Mother Nature will rebalance that. And, and, you know, we can see that in the way that nature is shifting and, um, you know, these big natural disasters occur. Uh, in a way, it's Mother Nature you know, getting rid of a few human beings, um, I think. And of course, then, you know, we, we talk about that as the disaster. Actually, it's just a rebalancing. Um, unfortunately, the universe and Mother Nature doesn't get selective about which human beings get, um, get balanced out. Yeah, in, it's only a disaster the, for us, right? Yeah, you know, let's put Trump in, on, in the next mudslide, please. Um, <laughs> or whatever it might be. Yeah, we just need um, to get him, in a, get him in a shanty town in the Philippines or something <clears throat> first. That's the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, wherever the next thing is going to happen, let's let's kind of try and teleport him there just in time. Um, so it's it's really tough. I mean, you know, yesterday I was I had just finished a beautiful swim in the sea, and I came into the shore, and there's an Egyptian family sitting at a table right on the edge, and this adult woman drink finishes her water out of a plastic cup and throws the plastic cup into the sea. Oh, jeez. And I went. Ballistic. My Arabic is not great, but Jesus, that woman got it. <laughs> Every bit of Arabic that I have uh, access to, she got it at high volume and was she was really quite quite shocked. But I could not contain my rage in that moment. It's like you're you're sitting there with your children. You know, she had teenage children, and actually the daughter got me way before the mother. The mother was like looking at me, just going, "Well, what did I? You know, who who are you? Why are you talking to me?" And the daughter could see me holding this cup. She's like, "Oh, it's okay. No, no, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry." It's like, come on, people. This is not a rubbish bin. You know, I I try to I try to give them a um, an experience of what they've done. So you know, recently I was driving in a taxi. I saw a guy just drop his plastic litter on the street and I got the taxi driver to stop I went along the road there he strewn two or three pieces as he was walking I picked them up ran after him saying excuse me excuse me and he turned around and I said oh these are yours and he looked at me and to his credit actually a big smile came across his face he said oh yeah I'm sorry but it's um you know I think the people who are aware have to recognize don't be shy be a pain in the ass yeah be the pain in the ass these people need to have the mirror held up to them because I think otherwise we don't we don't we're not serving them in learning you know as long as you criticize them but they don't receive the message directly they don't have the opportunity to learn so we can't we can't you know we can't expect them to change um you know a lot of them have grown up you know the Philippines Egypt a lot of these really beautiful countries have not had an education system um which has allowed them to understand these, um, you know, these facts. Plastic does not biodegrade. Plastic will be there. Plastic will kill the fish and the and the coral and the turtles and whatever. And um, and we need to change now urgently. But uh, you know, like you say, things are changing. Awareness is 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 growing, and um, hopefully, technology is going to come along and provide us with some solutions as well. Because uh, we really needed all the help that we can get right now. I always really, I'm always really interested to find out about people's uh, morning rituals. If you have one, I'm kind of guessing <laughs> you might have one. Um, uh, yeah, more or less, more or less. It's so, it's in and out a little bit sometimes, but yeah, um, my morning ritual. Uh, so get up, brush my teeth, and brush my tongue. This is the most important thing for me to brush my tongue first thing in the morning. Um, and then uh, at the moment, I'm making my own kombucha. So I have a kombucha. And then uh, I will do some kind of meditation practice or mindfulness practice. Um, sometimes that involves walking my dogs on the beach and having a swim. Sometimes it's sitting. Um, yeah. And then it's breakfast time. Yeah, I'm always really interested to find out because for me, like, developing a routine 
was kind of like a, mm -hmm. a big catalyst to allowing me to kind of transform personally and um, yeah. after living as a as a night owl for the best part of my adult life up to that point like getting up early in the morning you know and, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, doing the same sequence of things every morning like once it yeah. became a habit for me just the rest of my life just turned around so um, yeah. <clears throat> I must remember to brush my tongue though that's one that I'm <laughs> definitely have to add in there yeah yeah um, yeah no I mean morning rituals it's interesting because it really sets your energy and, and, and the quality of your mind for the day and I think you know when I've worked with private clients and is one of the parts of my work actually is is helping people to develop a regular meditation practice and say so, yeah but can I can I do it when I come home from work and it's like well you can of course you can but you're you know you will that there's a difference you know everything we do has the cause and effect thing so um and to give people the opportunity of going through a, a discipline practice for long enough and sometimes it's a week two weeks before they suddenly realize oh my god i'm feeling completely different uh, it can happen very very quickly so yeah the mornings are are important and you know in, in the in the scriptures it's of course that which is quite tough, you know, the pre-sunrise um, energy where, where you know, wherever you are on the earth in those hours, the, the energy of the, the, the coming day is sort of gathering and it's really the strongest time where your mind can connect to the universal mind and you have access to this universal wisdom. So this is, you know, it's a strong, strong time where you can download stuff. You know, you, you get insights, you make strong realizations about yourself, about the way you're living, about where you need to be going. You can see visions, you can, so yes, you can do it when you come home from work, but you know, you're missing that, that access point, if you like. The way that we've kind of we've built it into our lives now to stay up as late as possible in front of a screen, um, mm. and then, Horrible. and then also that when we decide that we're going to start to wake up early, people don't, um, people don't realize that it takes time to adjust to like a new habit and to, mm. uh, you know, it could be two or three weeks, but usually people don't even get past the first week. So they don't get to see the transition. So yeah, it, um, it's not me. I'm, I'm not designed. I don't work that way. Yeah. Give up. And, you, and there are some people as well who I talk to and I'm like, what's your morning uh, uh, ritual? And they're like, oh, you know, I get up at 11, eat McDonald's or something like that. And it's like, and, you can, <laughs> and it completely works for them. You know, you can see that there's absolutely no need for this person to have a ritual. Um, yeah. But uh, that's not me. So, <laughs> and I know it's, mm. I know it's not a lot of other people as well. No, I, I think also that once you start on this path of uh, consciousness and you start to really um think more about your lifestyle that you would also realize that 11 o'clock in a mcdonald's is not supporting you because you know the thing is is we're also we place immense demands upon ourselves you know um the the speed at which we live and the the amount to which we have to deliver um the quality that we have to deliver in our lives our work lives and our personal lives is so huge and yet we expect our bodies and our minds and our souls to be able to deliver when when we're giving it, you know, 50% of the energy that it needs. Yeah. Um, and this is why, you know, illness, stress-related illness, breakdowns, uh, mental health problems are at an all-time high. It's because we are stretching ourselves and we don't realize actually the giving back is in taking that time for ourselves. It's, it's you know, when you when you give to yourself first thing in the day it's like you're filling your cup and then whatever demands come you've got something to give but if you haven't done that first thing in the morning you're empty and then you're you're drawing on your resources you're drawing on your own reserves rather than something that you've already given to yourself and can give from freely um you know this is where my this is where my colitis came from i was you know i was a burnt out londoner living too fast and, and not putting enough back in um so and you know there are you see it everywhere have you got a book or have you got an author that you recommend for me and for our listeners 
because you know we're often traveling to dive sites we're on planes we're sitting around being lazy because we're in between dives and stuff like that so yeah. i do a lot of reading i know a lot of other free divers out there do as well mm. who would you recommend for the next book okay oh i should have prepared for this question <laughs> um okay so a book that springs to mind which positively surprised me in many many ways was Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic. She's the author who did Eat, Pray, Love, uh, you know, which is a Hollywood blockbuster and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I I guess I thought she was always going to be chick litty. But um, this book, Big Magic, is all about the spiritual process of being creative. And when I read it, it was one of the most positively affirmative uh, messages that I'd read about what I experienced as a freediver, the process that we go through in terms of opening ourselves up to a higher power and allowing that energy to flow through us for the magic to occur, and recognizing also that the ego plays an important part, but it needs to be balanced in order for the magic to really happen. So I thought her book was really really powerful, very joyful, uh, very affirmative in, in in many, many, many ways. Great. So that was mm -hmm. Elizabeth Gilbert, and the name of the book was? Big Magic. Big Magic. Okay, I'll put that in the uh, the show notes for uh, for the listeners, yeah. and I'll, I'll yeah. check it out myself as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to think of this. I mean, I'm always reading. I'm, I'm doing Harry Potter at the moment, though. <laughs> I'm working. I think I'm on book four. <laughs> I came to it rather late in life and late in Harry Potter's life as well. So, Sarah, where can we find you on social media? Um, what's your uh, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and all that? Oh, my goodness. Um, okay, Facebook, Sarah Campbell, Discover Your Depths, or Discover Your Depths, Sarah Campbell, I don't know. I have a personal page, but I also have the um, the, the, the page page. Yeah. Um, Instagram, I think I'm Sarah Campbell DYD, although that may be changing. I have a girl who does my social media and she's like, no, 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 that you've got no strategy. <laughs> okay, Is that Ashley? Fine. Yes, yeah. exactly. Ashley's been so friendly in our emails. She was uh, she's great. really nice to, yeah. to, to communicate yeah. with. Yeah. No, she's super. So, yeah, she uh, she needs to organize me a little bit more on that front. So, that, yeah, Facebook and, and Instagram, um, yeah, I think I'm fairly easy to find. You essentially answered every single question that I had without me really having to ask you. So uh, <laughs> it was a very relaxing and, uh, and, and you know, easy interview for me to do. Yeah, it's been fun. It's I, I mean, I think interviews are far more profitable for both sides when it just becomes a conversation rather than a Q&A session. But um, no, I really enjoyed talking to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Likewise, likewise, in two sittings yeah. we did it. Yeah, we did it and uh, we, we time traveled during this interview. That yeah. was awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did. I hope people can keep up with us. Sarah Campbell for sharing her amazing story and ideas and you can be sure as soon as I can I'll be heading over to Dahab to see her at the Blue Hole. What did you think of the show? Let me know. Add me on Facebook. My name is Donnie Mac, D-O-N-N-Y-M-A-C. I'm on Instagram as Donnie McFar, D-O-N-N-Y-M-C-F-A-R and I'm here to answer questions and listen to your suggestions for how to make the show better. Remember to subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast provider so you don't miss an episode and share the Free Dive Cafe with your friends. Until next time, dive safe.